Mic check, mic check. One, two, three. We in good? Check, check. Check, 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 check. Coming through. And All right, here we are. Check, Sounds like check. the volume's One, two, good. Let's drop good. that down. And uh, hey, great. Uh, my name is Phil Kearney. I create role-playing games. I illustrate them. I publish them online. And I've been focusing on Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition uh, since the release of Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica back in 2017. Um, that got me jump-started into building game content for 5e because I, I think like a lot of MTG enthusiasts, we thought we'd see a lot more uh, information, ideas, and, and game mechanics around color, mecha uh, color magic. And it didn't happen. So that's what triggered me to, to get jump started into making 5e content. Um, you can uh, check out uh, the, uh, the five color mana spell point variant rule system that I created, the core mechanics, uh, spell point warlocks, uh, knights and tricksters. So we actually have expanded that uh, since then. You can check out that content down here if you're interested in the uh, color mana uh, very rules uh, bundle here on DMs Guild. I also finished the spell jammer combat and exploration that we've been working on uh, all throughout last year. And uh, so we are working on martial powers right now. Here's the playtest content you can click through to on my Patreon and then click martial powers. That'll take you to a read only document here online. Uh, basically, uh, this is currently and uh, the playtest document is sitting at Jazz McCrew. Uh, we're at 113 pages right now of solid content, basically converting all of the Barbarian, Fighter, Monk, Paladin, Ranger, and Rogue classes into a mana source system that matches and reflects the uh, color mana spell point variant rules that we have on DM's Guild here. You can check out all this stuff. Uh, Spellpoint Warlocks is like 20 sales away from being a gold bestseller, which is absolutely insane for a, uh, for a pay what you want. But uh, other than that, uh, all the stuff that's inside here, basically it creates a, uh, it replaces the eight schools of magic uh, with the five color system from Magic the Gathering. It replaces spell slots and ignores the Dungeon Master's Guide suggestion about spell points and creates a much more intuitive one-to-one -one spin ratio. First level costs one point, ninth level costs nine points. It's pretty straightforward and obvious stuff. So, well, hey, what's up, Super? It's good to see you, my guy. So this is a uh, spoiler alerts for any uh, any of my play testers that are going to be on board with us. Uh, but I, I don't particularly care if people get to see what happens uh, because it's not about the content. It's it's about the it's about the plague flow. So, uh, Ope, don't know if I'm allowed. Yeah, absolutely, you can be. I don't particularly care. So every week, I am the the play test team, which Shay here is going to be a member of. Uh, you, you pick a tile and then you move through it. So um, get this stuff without any further ado. Just to, just a clean up. Uh, big shout out to the uh, Ravnica DM section on, uh, on Reddit. It's an awesome subsection. It has great flavor mechanics for Ravnica and has been a really big supporter and enthusiast for the work that I do. So thanks a lot, guys. Um, I'm on the X Twitter platform. If you're still there, I'm at Phil Kearney. You can see whenever I'm publishing stuff there as well. And of course, like, subscribe, hit the bell icon to get notifications of when I'm live in the future. I'm here uh, five days a week, 10 times, uh, 10 times Monday through Friday in the morning, lunch times Mondays, Tuesdays, and Fridays like today, and then uh, Mondays and Thursday nights like tonight. So um, I'm here a lot. We're doing lots of stuff. You are most welcome uh, to participate and uh, check out my Discord, which is also in the link down below. So yeah, you're absolutely welcome to be here. Um, I've been running over this stuff for the past few weeks. Uh, we are now at a place where the, um, the, the mechanics that we have, the, the team built a bunch of really freaking cool characters on Saturday, part of our session zero. We're third level. We've got, uh, uh, what do we have? Uh, we have an Izette Battlemaster, uh, a bug, yeah, an Izette Bugbear Battlemaster. Uh, we have a, um, uh, a Simic hybrid monk, way of the four elements, using blue and green magic, of course, to control elements. Uh, we have a, uh, a Boros uh, white and red paladin, Oath of the Crown, uh, to further lead the glory of, uh, of Boros into battle. And to counteract that, we have a, um, a Rakdos uh, giant werewolf on fire. Uh, that is uh, playing the uh, barbarian giant uh, who's leaning into the uh, the rage mechanics as a giant of having free and large 
and uh, and sustaining a lycanthropy effect that turns him basically into a giant werewolf. So, cool team. Uh, I think uh, I think a really big fun shout out is um, is for uh, NAC's uh, battle master that he built. Uh, the the battle master has basically six maneuvers. That's basically all he does is either distract or hinder opponent's action economy or uses his bonus actions and actions to grant other t p players on his teams additional actions through their reactions like a battlesmith. And when he took one of the powers he took was a, a was healer's kit. So he's got uh, the, the healer feet. So he's got a healer's kit that you guys can uh, will be able to uh, scavenge resources in, uh, in green and blue tiles to replenish. And, uh, and then he can just use the healer kit, which allows you to uh, gain basically, it's basically like a, a really weak heal spell, but we don't have any dedicated healers on the team. So it was a brilliant decision to do that. I think the team is really well-rounded. I'm really, really excited to run the team. And so what we've been doing here for, uh, for the past few sessions is building out what the first tile is going to be. And so, what's up? Uh, Milo, hey, what's up? And you were thinking I'm going <laughs> but he's back. Glad to see it. Hey, yeah, Bob, you are certainly welcome to be here, my guy. Uh, how's the drawing job? I mean, hey, man, art is art, right? It just keeps flowing. Uh, but right now, I'm being a game developer. So, uh, we've been building this uh, this rubble belt, hex crawl. Well, it's a square, not a hex, but the term still stands. I've got about 40 minutes for me to play today. And uh, the working document that I have here as the DM, um, again, huge spoilers, but I don't really care if the team catches wind of this stuff. The first land tile that the team is going to go into. So here's the story so far. The team is going from one um, civilized region to another in on the Ravnica world. There's huge hundreds and hundreds of miles of, uh, of ruined um, wasteland of destroyed uh, urban environment between those two sections that have been completely overrun by nature for hundreds of years. Uh, there's many uh, independent intelligent uh, tribes and organizations that know nothing about the, the guilds, the guild pack, that don't know anything about civilized Ravnica at all, uh, other than the Gruul, which are the dominant force in the Rubble Belt in general. So everyone kind of tries to maneuver around or, or work deals with Gruul to carve out their own piece of land. And so the team, the, the adventure is the team is going from um, the east to the west in an ornithopter, like a basically like a, a giant uh, heli carrier. And for one reason or another, the, the thing went down, it loses power, it crashes in a swamp, uh, which is this massive starting black block here. And uh, and then the team's the the the, the playtest of it is for the team to go from tile to tile to tile to secure the, uh, uh, to basically head westward, west march towards their destination, or to maybe find something inside this rubble belt that might still, like some means of communication or, or way of being rescued uh, before they're able to march their way out. And they've got hundreds of miles to go. So like, just like walking your way out is pretty unrealistic. But if you wanted to run a full campaign that way, at some point your character is going to be able to fly over it and then deal with only aerial threats. So we're using basically half casters that, uh, that start at third level, then fifth level, seventh, and then finally ninth level. So by the time we get to ninth level, flight is going to be something that's going to be far more common and available to the team. But at that point, I think we're going to see a lot of uh, we want to see a lot of emergent story, um, uh, a lot of story and plot. And goals emerging from that that may well tie the team to the uh, the rubble belt that is going to give you reasons to uh, to advance and motivate through it. So hey, what's up? Blunt smoking penguin, <laughs> love it. Hey, just saying, what's up, G? Uh, let me catch up on the text here. So let's see. Uh, hey, uh, been a while. Yep, yep. Uh, again, uh, hey, cool, right on. And 3D mod, nice animation. Sounds like you got a lot on your plate, my guy. Square crawl, yeah, yeah, square crawl. I'm calling them tiles. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, what systems are the games going? To, uh, this is uh, this is five E. It's the uh, it's the mana system uh, that I've been. Oh, you might be asking each other stuff, but um, I do stuff like that. Yeah, right on. That's awesome. 
Um, so yeah, we're using the uh, fifth edition color man system that we developed. It's now built out uh, in the playtest document for all the art, uh, all the uh, the martial classes. So once this book gets published, probably in 2025. Let's be realistic. Uh, once it publishes, though, we'll have all 13 classes in fifth edition, all capable of using the same color mana system together to be able to freely multi-class and build characters um, as um, as fluidly as you can with normal 5e, but having gotten rid of the eight schools of magic, replacing it with the five colors, removing spell slots and replacing it with the tap and burn magic system, uh, mana, uh, spell point resource. So this is all coming along really, really nicely. But uh, right now, we are diving down into the depths um, we had, I, I won't, uh, I won't necessarily reiterate everything that we had built before, but, um, uh, basically they're starting off in a blue, blue tile. So when it's double blue, if it's blue, white, for example, here, or blue, red, obviously this is going to be, is territory? This is Selesnia territory, but when it's a, when it's color on color, this is the region color is blue. And then each tile is a different, you know, you know color one to five. So when it's double blue, then you dive in further and you have a D4 of it either being Azorius, Demir, that, or Simic are basically the, 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 the four colors that it could be. So when we rolled up the random land tile, and if we are in the, again, the, the, the link to this is in the description down below. When we dive into the Rebel Belt and we look at the different types of lands that we have, we ended up with up. This is elevated land. Uh, this is level, like like ground level, and like uh, these uh, these V's is sunken terrain. So if you're on elevated terrain, that means that there's a vertical aspect of it going upward, and when it's sunken terrain, there's a vertical aspect going downward. That it basically creates a um, like difficult terrain. It takes longer to get through the space, and like with a blue elevated, we then go into the list of land types. So we look at blue elevated, and we ended up with uh, Skyline Cascades, um, which is a, a bunch of waterfalls that pour off of ledges, and there's a bunch of floating islands and, uh, and different skyway bridges that would connect all of these things that have been uh, basically dilapidated and released over time. So there's an element of floating islands above water. And so we have two environments that we have to create. We have to create the, 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 uh, uh, the ground level water environment which is God knows how deep until the team explores it. They won't know how deep it is, but it's, it's basically it's, it's trailing off into the swamp where they landed in. So when they leave the swamp, they're in broken terrain here to the south. It becomes hilly and mountainous terrain to the north. It, it levels out and dries out to become flatlands. So like this, and then you got swamp west of the larger starting square swamp. So basically this is like, um, uh, you can see how it like levels off with the plains here and then it starts to spike again with high island and then spikes up. Uh, this is level that this is listed as ground level, but red lands. So there's like these patches of ground that are flanking this waterway that goes from the swamp into a waterway into more swamp that then levels out and then heightens up in, a, in an elevated uh, plains tile. And then we have a sunken water tile here. So like we can expect to see, we have floating islands here, probably have floating islands here, probably have floating islands here as well. But this is all level terrain through here. So we have a swamp here, deep water swamp, and then a drainage that sinks underground. So there's a lot of interesting topography and each one of these squares represents 10 miles. So this entire, this entire region is a 30 mile region. But with this being uh, difficult terrain, difficult terrain, difficult terrain, difficult terrain, and the rest of this being a uh, normal type of traversing terrain, there's a lot of interesting environments and type of creatures that could be populating this area, which is part of the, the fun as a DM, the mini game that a DM gets to run is running random, like running uh, random numbers and, uh, and, and just uh, randomly generating terrain, inhabitants, goals, hazards, enchantments, creature types that are inside of each tile that as a DM, my mini game during part of my game prep is that I get to imagine what is this environment like? What are their goals? What kind of conflicts exist? What kind of hazards can a team run across? So my, my prep work is me imagining 
this environment and, and to flesh it out in my mind. So as the team starts delving into it, I get to tap into my imagination, uh, remembering what coolness I, I imagined could exist inside of here and finding opportunities depending on what actions they want to take. Like what's the next cool thing that I can, I can encounter, I, I can lead them to so that they can have an encounter and start forming opinions about how they want this environment to act. A good hex crawl, or in this case, square crawl, as it were, um, the, um, it's uh, the, the best, I find the best way to play it is since you don't know what direction the team is going to go in, uh, the, the rules of the game is that the team picks, I, I pick the first tile, which is going to be blue on blue. But after the first session, if the team has secured the environment, basically what they can do is they can decide if the area has been secured. And if they feel the area has been secured, they can advance. Uh, that, that ornithopter I talked about crashing, it has a number of non-combatant NPCs that are basically get rescued from the crash. And now the characters as the heroes act as scouts to move ahead to forge a safe path for the rest of the non-combat characters to follow behind them. That non-combat caravan also becomes a safe spot for the characters to go back and rest for a long rest in numbers. So when the team needs to take a long rest, they retreat back to where the team had left the caravan. And if the area is secured, they'll be able to have a long rest without interruption. If they were wrong and they had not secured the area, or if they had scouted into a new area and drew attention from something hostile there, it could follow you back to the caravan and then you'll have an encounter in the evening where you're having to defend the caravan. So it starts off with the ornithopter crashing in the swamp. The first step the team takes, I arbitrarily decided to DM, which is into this into this blue tile. And then they'll be able to explore the, the, the floating islands and the waterways that, that are underneath it to see where can they carve out a path that's gonna be safe for their team, uh, their, their caravan to traverse through, which means they're either gonna have to kill, bargain, or trick their way through to secure a safe spot. Whether that means like they kill off all the sources of monsters, the monster generators in their in their uh, in their lairs to shut down the lairs so they don't create monsters to attack at night, or they form some sort of an alliance or bargain with them if they're capable of doing so, so that they can bargain that they leave their caravan alone while they're in their tile, and that may trigger encounters like if they encounter a creature in this tile and they make a bargain with them hey leave us alone what's it gonna take they could be like yeah uh, often this tile over here in this sunken area um we know there's a there's an opposing tribe over there and they're they're fighting with us over these uh, over these white tiles so if you can go there and drive them from these tiles we don't care how you do it but if you can drive them from those tiles we'll be able to take control of that area and we can assure you safe passage in those tiles for your caravan while you're there. So that then motivates your team to go into these tiles, find out what's going on. And if the source of the problem really is the tribe that's in this sunken area, then they may have to go in and dungeon delve into that sunken terrain to bargain, defeat, or trick whoever's in charge of that tile to be able to create uh, a safe space in this environment. Or you could subvert it, it's like, yeah, 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 We'll give you those tiles too, but just to go take out those guys that hired you. Now the team has a choice. Who do we actually want to help? And it, the, the, the goal is to march west. So if the team wants to just, you know, straight arrow it across all the tiles, I'll have like maybe two or three, maybe four or five sessions before they get to the edge of the currently known world before I have to actually generate more text, uh, more hexes. But I think I have enough content already the deal normally is, the, the way that the game is conducted is that each session, we're in one tile. So the team is going to start off and work through this tile, and at the end of the session, they're going to decide, have we secured it or not? If they feel it's secure, then they can move the caravan forward and take a long rest. Uh, if they don't feel it's secure yet, they can withdraw back to where the caravan is, roll a random encounter check to see if they get attacked at night or not, and if they don't, They'll have their long rest like usual. If they do get attacked, uh, if they're able to fend off the attack, then you can have one encounter per long rest and still get it. It'd just be a bonus combat as a defense, as, as basically a tower defense that will be fighting off enemies that are coming after you. Uh, and then after they secure the long rest, they will then go back 
to that same tile because they've chosen because well i arbitrarily chose this tile but in the future like after they defeat this tile if they decide to go after the swamp tile they stay inside that swamp tile until they either secure it or give up on it and if they give up on it then it becomes hostile all the time and as long as you're adjacent to it it will it will force combat in at night so you're guaranteed to have an extra combat that you're gonna have to deal with with your caravan so if you move into a tile we're starting with this double blue once they once they either secure it in one go go back get a rest come back go back come back however long it takes for them to secure it they will at some point have secured it by either depleting the enemies or by forming alliances or tricking them or compromising with them somehow to secure it and once they secure it then they're free to choose another tile to move to and whatever that tile is may be dictated by whatever bargain that they create or while they are exploring and resolving this tile, they may find out more information about the adjacent tiles that they could then move into to help inform their decision about what their next move is going to be. If this was an ongoing long form campaign, I would drop them down here into the swamp and I might have all the tiles surrounding the swamp occupied so I have a more vibrant ecology that can feed conflicts into whatever path they go with. But considering the nature of the play test, we're just going with a West March. So we're just gonna march westward. So I'm only working, I'm only bothering with westward tiles. So that's the general, that's the general theme of the campaign. And in previous sessions, I'll catch up in the text here in a second. Previous sections, we'd already gone through all of the RNG of generating what the conflicts are, what the type of terrain is what the type of challenges, the enchantments, the hazards, and the monsters are that they're going to be facing. We also built out some of the stats for the monsters. Uh, there's two factions, two primary factions in this tile, one in the elevated region and one in the level water region. So I've already resolved the water region, and now I want to go through and uh, flesh out the, uh, uh, the, uh, the Sky Island faction so that I know what the team is going to be dealing with. So that's that's the that's our endeavor. So having said all that, I'm gonna catch up on text and then we're gonna got and we'll dive on into it. So let's see. Um, so anyway, uh, fortify own squares as some better base. Uh, is there a way to the the goal? If this was a long form campaign, absolutely, you could secure an environment and if you wanted to take control of that region, you can. But the the uh, the plot, the the the, the meta narrative of the story is that you're trying to get your non-combat characters out either by just simply walking out of the rubble belt over time or while you're exploring the rubble belt finding old artifacts or enchantments that would allow you to get in contact with uh with allies in civilization to send a rescue ship to come out and pick you up for however long that would take so if the team is capable like uh, like for example um, in this du like in this double red elevated terrain over here, or like uh, in this uh, in this uh, blue red blue red these tiles, this blue red tile, it's possible this is Zet territory. It's possible they could have a working radio station somewhere in the in the rubble, and if they can find one, they might be able to use tinker tools and spin mana to be able to jumpstart the circuitry to get the radio to work again, and they could call for help. Um, they could like, uh, if they take on like this Azorius, these two elevated Azorius, um, tiles, uh, the Azorius Senate is, um, has, uh, like, uh, ornithopter drones that they would use for monitoring regions. It may very well be that they have a way station that could also get jump started for communication through an enchantment, like a, like a message stone system that they'd be able to contact people they know back in society to send something for help. But that's because of the style of this game. If this was uh, if this was an ongoing campaign, uh, there's not much reason for the nine guilds to be out here unless they're out there to either find something or to reclaim territory. In which case, the name of the game would be go to that specific tile, secure that area from threats, and start building out your dominion so that you're controlling more and more tiles in the region to secure it. Like if you were like if this was an Azet mission to rebuild infrastructure in this region. You might well start off here or maybe here or like in this red tile overall and secure that whole region so that you can prep it 
for non-com workers to come in and start rebuilding the infrastructure. So your job would be to, to, to create a large enough zone of safety free of threats that you could afford to have a large size workforce integrate into that area while you're sending out scouts, making bargains and locking down threats. Like very, very old school Beck me style dominion in a Ravnica flavor shell. That's the idea. So it just depends on what format you're running. The only reason we're doing the, the West March Rebel Belt is simply because, again, it's it's just a play test. I don't want an on necessarily have an ongoing storyline that's going to anchor them to one spot because I want them to keep moving through different tiles to have a large diversity of different types of threats, hazards, and enchantments that they're going to have to deal with for me as a DM to be able to play test it to make sure that the, the variety is good that I can actually make this a product to offer with all the other color mana stuff that I've already published. So like, here's all the mechanics for making characters. Now DMs, here's a toolkit you can use to drop these characters in specifically to build a non-urban hex crawl environment sort of game for Ravnica characters. So like Ravnica is all about the urban adventure, but what if you like fucking don't like urban adventures, but you love Ravnica? Throw them into the rubble belt. Or better yet, or not necessarily better, but alternatively, Put them in Spelljammer and have them go off into the Eternal Mists on uh, on Weatherlight ships to go explore astral space and get all fucked up in, in doing Spelljammer Planescape stuff if you want. Um, the choice is yours, but uh, having a Rubble Belt hex crawl system for like um, um, uh, wasteland environment stuff sounds like a lot of fun. So, Spelljammer for the win! Uh, are firearms allowed? Unless I'm wrong about that. Um, um, Ravnica generally doesn't have firearms. So, uh, I've got, uh, not the Mutant Mass when I say, but the MTG system. Whoosh. Non-linear story. Uh, any way to fortify, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, base, we talked about that. Never give up, never, <laughs> never, give up, never surrender. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, we do not currently have any open seats in the playtest. It's, it's Saturday morning from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Pacific, uh, California, Seattle time. Um, at the end of a four week stretch, we're going to be upgrading to level five and there's going to be another vote on my, uh, on my, on my discord channel to see if, uh, if Saturday remains the day, otherwise it might be Monday night or Thursday night alternatively, but for the next month or so, it's going to be on Saturday mornings and we have four people on our seats, but if, if for some reason somebody disappears and a seat opens up, drop into my discord channel, hang out, um, start building some momentum and, and uh, creating allies with other people that hang out on the channel. And, and if a seat opens up, um, raise your hand. <clears throat> Otherwise, um, next month we'll be doing fifth level, then seventh level, and then July, August we'll be doing ninth level. And at that point I'll, I'll be, I already did play testing with this at my home table for like nine months from level 15 to 20. So, um, I feel secure about that already. I just wanted to test the low end to make sure it feels right. And I wanted to build the rubble belt toolkit. So urban adventure, I've got thoughts about urban adventuring, but, uh, it's not, it, it this is not the time nor place to do it. Uh, so what we're going to do is, uh, we have the system here. I now get to delve into monster design. So I'm going to use a bunch of sample characters that we built as easy pickups for players. That if they if their character gets killed, they can just grab one of these sample characters and just throw them into the mix and build. Um, the team does not have access to Gruul until they make an ally out of a Gruul tribe. Once they do, they can use that as a source of um, uh, a source of Gruul characters moving forward. But for the time being, it's only the, the nine uh, civilized. Uh, guilds that are uh, that are allowed but here are the basic rules for monsters uh, if they're up to cr1 they're considered first rank um, players get a d6 as their starting die and it ranges up from d6 to d10 but monsters operate on a different scale so they go each rank is from cr1 up to cr5 9 13 and then anything CR 14 plus is considered fifth rank. So whatever rank these creatures, whatever CR they are, dictates their rank, and their rank determines a wider array of dice. Because characters are more squishy at low levels. 
they can deal out a lot of damage, but they can't take as much. So they start off with D4s with CR1, D6, D8, D10, D12. And this is the number of powers that a creature can know. Uh, first rank will have up to two powers, three, four, five, six. So by the time you get the really high CR creatures, they can have a really wide range of, of things that they can do on top of what... Like you take the normal character, the monster stat block, and then you embellish it with powers. So, for example, we're going to play with pixies today. So, I'm going to look up what a pixie can do real quick, and then we're going to embellish it. So, we're going to go to D&D &D Beyond. We're going to go pixie. What's up? Civilized guilds. He laughs. He laughs in hostility. Um, how are you? I'm, I am doing... Hey, bootleg, I'm doing great, man. Uh, imagine making some survival-style 5e base game system inspired by Dune. Ah, uh, yeah, right on. There's uh, there's new Dune board games that have come out, and there's also a new Dune MMORPG that's being created. There's probably going to be a lot of ideas that can be harvested from that. Uh, let's see. CR 1 fourth. So we're going to look at Pixies. Uh, CR... Uh, Pixies, tiny size, CR, one fourth. Uh, we're going to go with, uh, let's see, what do they got? They got fly. <clears throat> and we're going to go with, um, what are their goods? Proficiency bonus plus two. Has advantage on saving throws against spells. Uh, magic resist equals um, save with advantage. Hover 30 feet. Innate spell casting. Holy shit, they've got a lot going on. Uh, Pixie's innate spell casting abilities is charisma. Uh, spell casting DC 12. Let's let's check it out. So we have uh, at will equals druidcraft. Wow, that is a surprising array of options they have access to, and then they have superior invisibility as well. At will equals invisible. As if concentrating on a spell. <clears throat> uh, let's see. At will, invisible until um, break concentration. Plus, what is our concentration? They are minus one on the roll. Holy crap, they got flimsy concentration. That's great. Whew, wow, once per day confusion. That's fantastic. So let's see. Uh, we'll go with um, confusion. Druid craft. I'm going to switch that to dancing lights. Once per day. I'm going to make these more narrative since they don't have much technical value. I definitely want to keep these limited once per day. The tech magic does work against powers. They can't, martial powers can't be dispelled. Uh, they can't be countered, but they can be dispelled. But the martial characters don't have many means of dispelling magic at all like like martial power martial characters can't really dispel martial powers or they're, they're pretty much stuck with being affected by them until they can overcome them this is interesting i'm going to get rid of let's see um utility spare
I'm breaking these up into categories. So confusion, entangle, Shaman Utility. Yeah. So the normal grunts are only going to have access to Entangle and Confusion. They all get the same Druidcraft, Dancing Lights, Detect Good and Evil, so they can kind of get a dig on who you are and what's going on and do distracting stuff with lights and tend to their land. Warrior types, combat stuff. This is where we're going to see powers coming in. And then we'll have a shaman, which is more like a leader type, um, that will have access to these things. And if the team escalates conflict or gets themselves into a negotiation that goes sideways, like the, the shaman will have access to detect thoughts, for instance, and dispel magic. And we'll be able to polymorph you or put you to sleep. Allow people to fly. Like it, it's, it acts as that, that leadership thing to help accommodate the team. Uh, but first, uh, so this is a CR1, which means it's first rank, which means we have access to first rank powers for the creatures to be able to utilize to embellish their kit. And they're only up to first rank. So I'm going to catch up with the text down here. Do not send pixies to the Skeletor factory. <laughs> I heard of that before you were okay. I had some woke scrap while I going. I, pff, I don't care about any of that stuff. I could see, uh, tell some new heroes of Mutants and Mastermind players. One tip, do not send. Nice. Uh, for my stuff, planning out a brand new YT channel because I have burned out from the webcomic hype of mine since last time I've seen Oh, right on, man. Ever-changing world, my dude. Ever-changing world. Let's see if there's anything hip in here that we want to pick up. Um, natural Hunter, Practice Charlatan. Ride the wind, resilient. We're making that saving throw before you know the result. You can roll one power die. Sage, swift tool, unnerving. Uh, we're gonna go with um, exploits one per encounter equals um, plus one d4 to ability check. I'm making these things simple to use, but have a little extra flavor. So, like when you're like when you're dealing with warriors, the each one of them will be able to use an exploit to basically give themselves a bonus to ability checks. Um, let's look at since it's only first rank, there's only so far they can go. Let's see, what do I want to do? Oof, coordinated attack, coordinated dash. You can empower a target ally that you can see, they can hear or see you. The reaction you can make an opportunity attack, rolling one power die. Permana channeled. Um, I like the idea of them working as a team. Distract target creature you can see and can see in you and can see you, so they can't be invisible while they do this kind of stuff. So it has limited engagement. Uh, cannot take reactions until you can no longer see it or you succeed in an intelligence saving throw. See, this stuff can be these things can be. Um, DMs can use all this stuff against players the same as players can use it against monsters. It's like if I were to hook up pixies with the distracting um, um, maneuver, then they wouldn't be able to turn invisible while they're distracting you, which puts them at risk. So I think I actually want to do that. Maneuver, and this is going to be, uh, let's see, at will, once per day each. This is going to be, yeah, um, distract. Uh, equals can't be invisible. You can't react until int save. And we already have the DC for the int save is only a DC 12. So I can hit you with this. This would this would be like a warrior pride thing amongst the pixies. They, they can turn invisible to escape people at any time. But the really brave warriors in the pixie tribe specifically don't make themselves invisible so that they can sustain this distraction effect to try to draw fire so that their enemies can come in or escape as needed. It's a bravery thing. They are willingly letting down their natural ability 
to be unseen so they can draw your fire as, as like a like a heroism thing. I think that's I think that, that kind of vibes pretty cool. Um, so I'm going to leave it with that. That's plenty. And uh, so then we can drop down to let's see. We have the exploit and we have distract. I'm going to let go of the exploit because they're only supposed to have a maximum of two powers. And they already have a bunch of spells and stuff. The Confusion's great. That'll fuck you up. Entangle's great. It'll slow you down. Distract is a really cool flavor mechanic that we just talked about. Let's see if there's any interesting low rank reactions or anything else that we would want to use. I don't see reactions being a big thing for them. Um, so we're going to skip past reactions. Let's look at strikes. Hmm. Knowing what they are. Let's see what our text is doing. Hey, by the way. Okay. Uh, I asked AI hey, what games flop, what games flops could like that most and the AI fired back with Ultima the Profit. Well, pretty good game. If I would enjoy it, eh, I'll write on. Uh, made in Blender, but how do you want to know? Since then, my main series of the AI genome engineer 101, history of programming, languages, right on. Good luck. Good luck, Milo. Uh, let's see. What is a fun, what's a fun thing to do? So they're firing arrows, right? They, they get the little pixie bows. So let's see what kind of pixie bow damage these kids can do. They have no attacks? What? Really? They have zero attacks. Is that is that the truth? Is that what we're looking at here? They can just basically lob some spell effects at you and that's it. They they wow. Okay, well I'm gonna override that. We're gonna give them we're gonna give them both. Uh let's go with uh wow, that's some fucked up shit, man. And now we're gonna pick out we're gonna pick out a strike attack that they can use. So instead of like they can attack and cast a spell, or they can attack with a power, and that's it. And I think you know what? I think goading strike is probably the most sensible thing that these little guys would have. Uh, your weapon damage increases by, well, for the Pixies, it'd be a D4. So damage increases by D4. Um, the creature you strike has disadvantage on attacks made that doesn't target you. So that leans into that uh, that uh, um, that heroism uh, of uh, distracting strikes. Uh, the effect ends when it successfully hits you with an attack, and the creature can attempt to end the effect by succeeding in intelligence saving throw. So I like that. Goading strike makes a lot of sense. Plus one D four and dis unless this attack unless target you and save. I'm good with that. What's your hit point capacity is supposed to be? Like seven? Hit points one. Get bent, kid. Wow. Yeah, talk about your minions. That's awesome, though. Holy Hannah, how fun. I could dump a shitload of these guys at you. 
And you just, as long as you hit him, you kill him. That's, that's a great first level thing to fuck around with. Entangle doesn't hurt you. Confusion, you can hurt yourself. I'm not giving them any big firepower. Um, their bow should actually, let's see, bow strength. Yeah, plus three, that's appropriate. So the D4 plus, it should technically be a D4 plus three. So there is some threat there. Attack should actually be plus five because you get a plus two prop and then a plus three from dex. Oof, these are dangerous, but almost everyone on the party has means of either being able to generate temporary hit points or to heal each other. So I don't mind peppering the, the third level. The worst number of hit points on the team is 18. So when I'm scaling damage, I need to look at uh, 18 as the baseline. So if I'm hitting them D4 plus three, it's going to average about five hit points. So that means that one character could get dropped after three attacks. If I'm hitting them with with mobs of like say d4 plus two pixies should only take at most two rounds for them to kick through them all because of action economy so i can maintain a two round combat against a against a flight of of, uh, of pixies that can uh, basically harass the team at any time they're attempting to either uh, uh, gain elevation explore a new area or making a lot of noise those are easy ways to draw attention when they're not underneath the uh, the floating islands when they're underneath the floating islands there's a different threat that they have to deal with so there's the dichotomy of the of the uh, sky dwellers and the under and the uh, and the uh, the uh, under rock um, faction so there's those two factions that the team is going to potentially be dealing with I like that I like that a lot uh, where are we at 46 minutes wow what great timing er, er, er. I got 10 more minutes and I'm pretty fucking happy with where we're at. I've already got. I think I already have enough uh, enough fuel inside of this uh, inside of this this land tile to really be able to challenge to be able to challenge to to give the team an interesting scenario for them to fuck around and find out about. Uh, shaman utility. I'm good with these things. Dum 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 dum. Don't need to do anything else about that. Um, I think, I think I'm happy with this. I know I'm not going to, I'm not going to be around tomorrow. Uh, I have to go, I have to go down, I have to go downtown, uh, for work stuff on Tuesday and Friday this week. So I'm thinking on, uh, I'm thinking on Wednesday, I'll have a session of something. I'm not necessarily sure what I'm going to do. But I'm, I'm pretty happy with this tile as it stands. So I'm going to hit save here. Um, what I could do is just start chunking around with a little bit of, just a little bit of artwork. Uh, here's, our, here's our grid of 20 different types of dungeon shapes. Uh, basically, uh, either over land um, to be able to tra traverse the terrain and these different point crawl, like these are points in a point crawl. And here's how the lines connect all of them, or rooms and caverns in a dungeon space. So whenever we have a dungeon lair, or like when we're doing overland movement, like we can either have the flow of water, um, difficult terrain, sinkholes, or skyways, adopting these general patterns inside of the tile to be able to traverse across that environment. And anything that's not on the, this line path is basically like rough or or threatened terrain. Like these are the quote unquote safest paths that may be trapped, but aren't necessarily full of hazards. And uh, so we can use that as our base uh, land mechanics. Like if like, uh, like, like to secure, to secure a tile, you need to visit and, uh, and, and uh, resolve each, uh, each, each dot on the, each point on the point crawl inside of that, inside of that tile. And once you go through and secure all those points, then you know, it's like, we've explored this area thoroughly. Everything seems safe here. We've overcome the challenges. We know what this place is about. We can safely move our caravan into this space to explore further. One, two, three, four, five. Right, uh, if you leave anything open inside, I mean, this one's like real linear, right? You just go down the path. That could mean that, that could mean there's like, like mountainous terrain or like if it's a skyway, it could just be like open sky 
on either sides on either side so you can't deviate from the path it might be boring but there could be like different types of traps and challenges that get presented at each point along the crawl but having having your overland built into a point crawl system that you can then check off all the boxes in the point crawl to secure the area makes it very gameable like it's a very gamified system for you to be able to know if you've overcome the area and if there's like monsters and that mon those monsters are going to have a lair which means like in one of these points, there is a lair that you need to dive into, which will be a different, so potentially the same, but likely a different type of five points. So you've got your overland that has its five points, and then somewhere inside of there, all the monsters are coming out to attack you from this lair. So when you delve into the lair, the lair gets opened up into another point crawl. So you'll have five points inside of their lair, and once you secure all points inside of the lair, the buttons there you go the layer is resolved and you've conquered and you've conquered that terrain uh, that that point in the in the in the tile so if there's only one sort of monster you only have one layer you have to deal with then all you'll need to deal with is random uh, random monsters hazards and possible rogue enchantments that are affecting the entire region if there's a rogue enchantment that will trigger another dungeon which will be another five point crawl inside of that space with the end goal of finding where the enchantment is at and then using either like um, like arcana checks, um, tinker tools, thieves picks, or mana spend to disable the enchantment. And once you disable the enchantment, the area that, that point becomes safe for your caravan to crawl through. So once you secure all points in, the, in a tile, the tile is secured, it now becomes a safe zone and you can advance on to another tile. So right now, I think I've got the I've got the verticality and uh, and the different dungeons that are in the blue tile already resolved. Right now, I feel like let's go to here first tile blue blue. I'm gonna put that at the very top of my list. Staple that up. Right now, I feel like I just want to fuck around a little bit. Just do a little bit of art doodle. I'm thinking about these floating islands. That's actually, yeah. What kind of a color am I using right now? The gray, struck in the black. <laughs> just pixies, that's it. See, <laughs> they do more things than it makes. Yeah, see, that's that's the thing. If you're so, if you're if you're DMing well, if if we're playing by uh, my effort, my my goal as a DM during this playtesting is to play D and D as intended, which is two or three encounters per short rest, uh, and then have like maybe eight encounters over the course of five points inside of a tile. So every time they go through, they can have like maybe. Two short rest, like they can take out one or two tiles, take a short rest, find a dungeon, go into the dungeon, resolve that, come out, take a short rest, take on another two tiles, maybe have a hazard, a random encounter or two, find out who's the mover and shaker in the area, resolve them. Uh, during that point, you're going to take a short rest, and then at the end of those five those those five points, you'll have anywhere from one to two challenges per point. Once those are all resolved, your day is over. You advance your caravan, and then we come back and we conquer it the next time. If it gets, if one, if uh, if we have a lot of shenanigans, uh, it'll slow progress, but that that's fine. We're just trying to throw some mana around, so I'll try to keep the team efficient. But yeah, my job is to try to keep fights that they have down to two to four rounds, so that they can burn through resources, fight through stuff, and actually move at a clip that the Dungeon Master assumes for a team that takes two short rests per day with a long rest at the end. With the intention of anywhere from, what, four to six encounters a day? Uh, four to six encounters per day, something like that. So uh, five to eight, I think, is where it's actually supposed to be at. By the way, he says, if I need some RPG advice for my game dev tutorial series, do I count, uh, do I, uh, do I, can I count on you? If, uh, if you drop into the server, uh, in, into my Discord, and, uh, and just fire up a topic of conversation about things, yeah, I'm happy to talk about it. 
Uh, it might be something I want to end up rambling about while I paint on stream. So, yeah, hit me up. So we're just going to make some floating islands here. So the way that an island would be when it was originally settled, we're looking typically at blue and white energy that's on these floating islands because that's just how Ravnica works. Buildings. You know me, I love philosophizing about game. I love game theory, I love DM crafting. If, uh, if there's something intelligent I can say that helps helps your efforts, then I'm, I'm happy to have opinions. I don't want to make, um, I, I don't want to have like uh, maps for every little place that characters can walk around on. Me as a DM, I work a lot with stick figure type stuff. Like here's your environment, right? Like here's a line that connects those two tunnels. There you go. I got ballpark stuff and eyeball things. And if people are going to get into a fight with stuff, if it's going to zoom in, uh, like with Spelljammer, I'll, I'll partition off a space. Like here's your characters, and then here's uh, here's enemies that are that are in zone with your characters, and I'll generally try to to limit engagement within like a ten by ten space before expanding out to an adjacent tile. Like I, I want to try to stay inside that tiling idea to help limit chaos. <laughs> I am just about done. I'm just going to fuck around with this for a few minutes because I want to. But this, this structure would be neglected for hundreds of years, right? So it's going to be less and less pretty. Like the butt of it, like, may, like, like if you look up, you might see like the interior of a space that doesn't have a floor anymore, but it might have like a stairway that just breaks off and just falls off into nowhere. Like this is the, this is the beginning of your, of your dungeon space. Like you can fly up into it now. Here's stairs that lead up to another level. But this would all be generally narrative, and then I'll just bullshit some quick sketchy maps. When you like, if you're messing around inside of this, like this, this this part of the structure here. It's, uh, it's ass might be gone. So you can just, like I said, just like float up into it if you can fly or climb up into it. I, I think there's gonna be like vines and, and ivy hanging off of all of these things. But this is a, this is a, I think a fun example of like what a, a floating, a, a floating island would have looked like in Azorius and yeah, largely Azorius territory because Azorius is white blue. So it looks something like that, but like these 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 pillar buildings would all be busted out. So I'm just kind of doodling and letting my brain flow a little bit. I'm I'm starting to ideate what kind of stuff the team can run across. Pixies can fly, so naturally they're going to want to stay off the ground. So them um, them um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, they they would they would be naturally inclined to elevate to these higher spaces to get off the ground to avoid threats. It just seems like a smart thing that they would do. It's like here's a here's a floating island, and then here would be another floating island. So I'm just kind of making shapes, and from that we're figuring out like where would where would buildings and structures pop out of that shape. And since it's all ruined, I can be kind of, or I don't have to worry nearly as much about architecture 
in structure other than I just need to hint at it and have some broken consistency now and again so that it feels like it's part of the same network of, of, uh, of construction but doesn't have a lot of requirement to, uh, like I, I'm not required to have a lot of exacting details because it's so old and overtaken. Like I can have a tree growing out of here. These things are fun to do, man. I gotta say, the Rubble Belt is like absolutely my favorite environment of, of almost any RPG setting. I, I, I love this hex crawl space. It's so cool. And I'm a, I'm a Dominion nut. I love establishing strongholds and securing the area and making deals. I love that geopolitical stuff, working out trade routes, uh, all, all the all the stuff that I can that I can lean in and use the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the the guilds and kingdom system that I've been developing. Um, I, I had to put that on hold for Spelljammer. So once the Eberron adventure gets done, I, I still have the color mana system to build out, but. Uh, after that, the, the next thing I technically have on my plate is going to be um, Guilds and Kingdoms. And I, I don't know if I'm going to do a Kickstarter for that. It'll be like 2026. But uh, kind of interested in doing a Kickstarter for that. I, don't, I, I have done no work in building an email list in my years of being an illustrator and stuff. It's just... All, all, all the all the time I spent in freelancing, I, I wanted to build connections with art directors, not actual players. It wasn't until um, just more recently that I was like, you know, I, I, I'm connecting with game players now. I should really think, think about establishing some sort of mailing list for players and DMs to, you know, help me succeed in the Kickstarter project. But I haven't... I haven't, I haven't really broken all that down, so it's it's nowhere yet. We'll see. We'll see what the muse wants me to do, and I'll just I'll just run the play that she tells me to. That's that's how I always do stuff. But yeah, here's some floating islands. So what's up? Well, yeah, I love that shit. I I'm a big Civ Five. I didn't like Civ Six, but huge Civ Five nut. What have you completed recently uh, for that supposed or Can you show me what have I? Do you not know that the book is done? <laughs> have you not have you not seen the Spelljammer book? Did I close my did I close my window? Reopen. Yeah, yeah, hold on. Um here's your more. And um Spelljammer Combat and Exploration on the DMs Guild. It's uh, it's already a silver best medal. Um, it, yeah, it's absolutely done. It's got five out of five off of two reviews so far. Um, had about 120 sales so far. 107 pages. This book just absolutely stomps. I am incredibly proud of this monster. But yeah, it is it is it's there for you, my guy. It is there for you. Uh, we've been building. I'll be working on it tonight as well. Uh, we've started uh, building out Vocaf's base into a 500-foot ship uh, to create a, uh, a combat scenario against uh, Prince Zealoth during Act Three of uh, the the uh, factions gathering at Vocaf's base in Doom Space. But yeah, this thing turned out pretty well, man. I, I really, really like how this book tied together all the little. Blarble space cutoff stuff is a lot was a lot of fun to do just uh, like a little filler spot art stuff but yeah solid book like 110 assets that are in the zip file when people buy it for like like building wild space systems and, and mapping combat and stuff like that it is uh it is good to go and the, the little navigation buttons work fantastic love that just love how well that worked out the adventure turned out pretty good. I, I like the. I, this taught me a lot about adventure formatting, 
that I'll absolutely be able to make use of when uh, I start uh, formatting the, uh, the Eberron adventure that we've been streaming in the mornings. And all this stuff is, yeah, it's all, it's all built out real pretty. And we have all the maps that are available for folks that are in the zip files to run these encounters. And all the artwork in these are the, all the pips and, and tokens and stuff that are actually in the art assets so that you can like just set it up like I show you. Like the, it's, it's, I'm, you're literally just mapping to what's demonstrated on the screen. And like we have, we have like example tactics for like all the, um, uh, like, uh, like uh, the, uh, the, the battle with Hestane. And as aesthetic, we have suggested actions for each of the combatants so that you have a general idea of what it is that they should be doing. The, uh, the Stain's duplicate is just a, a mirror image of his token. I, I, I'm personally kind of proud of that because it's silly and easy. But yeah, all this shit's broken down, man. It's, um, this, it's a pretty good project. I'm really, really happy with it. So anyway, hey, um... So yeah, that's there, and this is the Rubble Belt. Uh, our next test is going to be on Saturday. We actually get to start. We're going to throw the folks off uh, out of the swamp on, into their blue tile and start uh, start fucking around so they can find out what to do. And uh, so I'm going to go ahead and hit the brakes here for now. I'm going to be back tonight. I'll be back in about probably in about four hours ish, and uh, and we'll continue working on Vocast. It's a 500 foot battle station, so it's a it's a big map that we're working our way through. But God, it's it's turning out fucking great. So. Um, uh, anyone that's new to the channel, hey, like, subscribe, hit the bell icon, get notifications. I'm here 10 times a week, Monday through Friday. And my playtest is on Saturday. I'm not streaming that. In case anyone says anything stupid, they don't have to worry about getting themselves canceled or something. It's We're, we're here to have fun, not to destroy ourselves. So I generally do playtesting off screen. No one's signed up to be an actor or to behave themselves. So I want to keep that shit off screen. But um, yeah, that's it. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you can you can hang out and and peanut gallery while we play. But yeah, we stream. We'll be we'll be voice chatting through Discord, and it'll be on my roll twenty. So, but yeah, you uh, the Discord is um, you can find Discord um, through my Patreon, which is the about page of my Patreon. Uh, I update. Is this current? If it's if it's current, we're good to go. If it's not, I'll update it as soon as I get off stream. Oh crap! I'll update that as soon as we get off stream. So uh, give me five minutes, and that li that link will be updated. Otherwise, uh, I'm out for now. I'll be back in about four hours, and I'll catch y'all later. Thanks a lot. <laughs>